Join me in prayer. <coughs> Our precious loving heavenly parents, the parents of heaven and earth, and all humankind, we greet you this morning as we are beginning the syndicate service here, this historic edifice here in Washington, D.C. We pray always in humility, submission of heart, and also a redetermination on a daily basis to become your true sons and daughters. We want those sacred gods that you have been working throughout the 6,000 years to rebuild, to recreate, and to, to restore back to your original plan for humankind, your sons and daughters. So we always ask that as we listen that not only uh, we surrender our bodies, but we surrender, Father God, our hearts to you. We prostrate ourselves. We bow before you in our hearts. So that that much more, what we hear, can penetrate our original hearts and original minds. And once the original mind and once the original heart is continuously touched and recultivated, then sprouts and blossoms great victory, great determination, and a great Father outlook, and a re-understanding of who we truly are, and that we have been under the banner and under the, the guise of a lie from Satan, and that we have been submitting to the wrong master, and that the real master has awakened our original hearts and minds through the word. So as we read, we pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us, our true parents, our true fathers in the spiritual world, all the great saints and saviors and angels and absolute ancestors that are with us and are in this room. We pray mainly for the spirit of our heavenly parents to be with us and guide us. Speak with us and speak to us. In 
give us the farsight and the foresight that we need as we parent to become your true sons and daughters and to restore this world that we are responsible for in partnership with you. And we just open up this Pentecost service asking your blessings and guidance. And we put this together as Blessed Central Family. And in my name, Gregory James Oliver, and Fumi Oliver, and all of the family, as long as it's telling no joke, we all do report our Jew. Good morning. Good morning. Let us begin the read. Thank you. <coughs> Have a seat, please. We're on page 145. 143. Yeah, somehow. Okay. Absolute sexual morality or conjugal love for the purpose of God's creation. Which one? I start with this purpose. God's purpose of creation. Respected leaders from around the world, what do you think is God's ultimate purpose for creating human beings? It is to experience joy in relating with ideal families filled with true love. What does an ideal family look like? When God first created human beings, he made Adam representing all men and Eve representing all women with the intentions that they become owners of true love. And what was the quickest way for them to cultivate a character of true love? Simply put, it was to secure a parent-child relationship with God whereby they should live in attendance of God as their father and form a model family embodying God's ideal of peace. They were, have, they were to have followed the path of living as one family with God, experiencing joy eternally. God created Adam and Eve and established them as the first ancestors of humankind to form the model family and establish an ideal of peace. He committed himself completely to raising him, them as his son and daughter who were to be encapsulated of the entire cosmos, mediators between the spirit and physical world and lords of creation and who would be joined with him through true love, true life, and true lineage, absolute sexual morality, and conjugal love. Ladies and gentlemen, it was necessary for Adam and Eve to establish a model, peaceful, ideal family. God, the absolute being, created human beings as his children in order to instill in them absolute values on the basis of an absolute standard. Thus, human beings must follow the way of the absolute standard in keeping with the demands of the heavenly path. This means we must follow our destined life course in order to attend God, the absolute being, as our parent. In other words, for people to perfect themselves in resemblance of God and attain the stature of people of character who can be called sons and daughters of the absolute being, they must follow the path based on the absolute standard God has determined. The essence of this path is a standard of se absolute sexual purity. The first stage is maintaining absolute sexual pur purity prior to getting married. After we were born, we go through a process of growth. We pass through an infancy, childhood, in every and in a very safe and secure environment embraced in our parents' love and protection. We then enter the time of adolescence, which signals the start of a new dynamic life as we forge relationships on a totally new level with those around us, as well as with all things of creation. This is the moment when we begin to travel the path to becoming an absolute human being internally through the perfection of our character and externally by reaching adulthood. 
Yet, at this time, there is an absolute standard required that people must be, no matter who they are. This is the requirement of maintaining their purity. This is the motto of absolute sexual morality for human beings. God gave it to his children as their destined responsibility and duty to be carried out in order to fulfill the ideal of creation. This heavenly path is thus the way to, toward perfecting the model of absoluteness and conjugal love. What was the single word, the one and only in commandment God gave to Adam and Eve, the first ancestors upon their creation? It was the commandment and blessing to maintain an absolute standard of sexual purity until God's approval of their marriage. We find the basis of this in the Bible passage that indicates that Adam and Eve were surely die on the day that they ate of the tree, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. If they had refrained from eating and observed heaven's command, they would have perfected their character and as co-creators stood with God, the creator, as his equal. Furthermore, they would have taken dominion over the creation and become the lords of the universe enjoying eternal and ideal happiness. It was God's blessing that he told them to preserve their purity so that they could marry with his blessing and his ch as his children, become true husband and wife, become true parents and give birth to children, true children. This knowledge deepens our understanding of this commandment. It is connected with the principle of absoluteness and conjugal love, which is the principle of God's creation. The profound truth within God's commandment lie, lay hidden with, throughout history. Human beings must inherit and live by and model absolute sexual purity that is intrinsic to God's ideal for creation. This is so that they might perfect their individuality as God's children and establish themselves as lords of creation. Second, in is the model absoluteness in the love of husband and wife, more precious than life itself. This is the heavenly law of absolute fidelity. Husband and wife are eternal partners given to each other by heaven. Who having children, they become the co-creator of true love, true life, and true lineage. And the origin of that which is absolute, unique, unchanging, and eternal. This is because it is the heavenly principle that one person cannot give birth to a child by himself or herself, even in a thousand years. How many people who preserve their purity before marriage? And whom God binds together in, his, in a pure marriage as husband and wife, deviate from the way of heaven and go astray, following the wrong path. We human beings are different from animals. If they understand God's purpose in creating them as his children, they will realize that the wrong path is one of unimaginable betrayal and defiance of the creator. It is a path of self-destruction. Along, with the, along which digs their own grave. Resulting from the human fall, this path falls outside the realm of the ideal of creation. Ladies and gentlemen, the absoluteness of conjugal love is the greatest blessing that heaven has bestowed upon humankind. Without adhering to the principle of absolute sexual purity, the path of perfection of one's character and spiritual maturity is closed. Furthermore, without securing the foundation of absolute sexual morality within a family, within a true family of perfected individuals, it is impossible for God to manifest his presence and dignity as the incarnated God of character. In order for God, the absolute being, to have direct dominion over our lives and to live and share joy with us, we who were created as his 
object partner, and children must assume the form of a perfected family based on the standard of absolute sexual ethics as God intended. Only within the boundaries of a family upholding absolute sexual morality is it possible to create relationships based on the ideal model of sexual ethics for life as it should originally have existed. This life includes the three generational realms of grandparents, parents, children, and grandchildren. Please understand clearly that God's eternal life and homeland and eternal life as a human being, eternal life are possible only on this foundation. Therefore, if Adam and Eve had achieved individual perfection, the perfection of, the, of character by upholding the principles of absolute sexual purity in accordance with God's will and then entered into conjugal relationship through his blessing, they would have attained complete oneness with him. God would have dwelled within their union. Their children also would have been linked to his holy order of love, enjoying a direct relationship with God as their parent. In other words, the marriage of the perfected Adam and Eve based on absolute purity and conjugal love would have been God's own marriage. God is forever God, but at the same time, Adam and Eve were to have become his incarnation. They would have become God's body. God would have settled with inside their minds and hearts become the true parents of humankind in both the spiritual and physical world on the foundation of absoluteness in conjugal love. So, um, starting on page 147, I would like to ask um, one of the brothers from Solomon Island to read either one. Why I chose Solomon Island, you know, Father spent a lot of time in Solomon Island. Amen? Mm -hmm. True Father. So the Messiah spent a long time, gave blessing to Solomon Island. So let's have one of our brothers from, young brothers from Solomon Island to read on page 147. importance of lineage. <clears throat> Do you know what has, has pained God's heart most, causing him the greatest grief over the long history since the fall of Adam and Eve? God lost his lineage, and with that, God lost the basis of human brotherhood and even his ownership over the creation. God's lineage is more precious than life itself. Without it, the the fruits of true life and a true love never matured. They become instead of the fruit of Satan, lacking any relationship with God, and from them descended the uh, 6.5 million people now filling the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, lineage is more important than life and more precious than love. <coughs> life and love come together and create lineage. Lineage cannot be established if either life or love is missing. Therefore, among the three love, life and lineage is the fruit. God's lineage contain the seeds of love. God's lineage provide the content and environment for a true life. Hence, for us to become the idle people envisioned by God, that is, people of idle character, and to create idle families, we first need to be linked to his lineage. To take it up, it, to take it a step further, only when we are linked to God's lineage, it is possible to create God's homeland. The ideal nation, <coughs> the kingdom of 
the peaceful ideal world established in this way through the relationship based on absolute sexual morality. Please inscribe the importance of lineage in your heart. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is because the parent-child relationship is the highest and the most important of all relationships. And the model, a line of relationship between parents and child, is the only way through which God's lineage can be bequeathed and, more, and made last forever. You must be clear on this point. However, it is false love, false life, and false lineage that have hand of the adulters, adulterers. However, it is the false love, false life, and false lineage that have infested the earth. God's love, life, and lineage fell into the hands of the adulterous, Satan. The enemy of love, heaven and earth were suffocated and transformed into hell. The world became a wretched place, far from God's presence, yet humanity to this day lives in ignorance of this. People are deluded into believing that the lineage of the enemy is the lifeline upon which the world depends. This is rich through about humanity descended from the fall. That is why we refer to this world as hell on earth. God's view humanity tragic situation with a heart full of pain. Furthermore, when due to the fall, Satan gained control of the realm of lineage. He also usurped the right to the elder son and the right to ownership. Who can comprehend the sorrowful, painful heart of God? God is like a father who worked and sweated his entire life to accumulate a set for his children, only to have thief steal everything in one night. God lost his lineage, lost his children, and was forced to hand over the ownership of nation in the world to Satan. My life, my life, Reverend Moon, whose task it is to complete the mission of the true parent, and has been one sorrow marked by inexpressible suffering and persecution. The third, Adam, Adam, the true parents, must indemnify and completely reverse all failures of the first, second Adam. He has the task to complete not only the mission of the Savior, Messiah, the Lord of his coming, but also the mission of all those major fingers who really, on whom religions are based with the similarities to the process of God's creation of the universe, his life has constituted the great work of the recreation of humanity. We are not even the smallest error in permitted. It has been a lonely course that cannot be fully comprehended by anyone. It has been the course that took him down thorny path through the wilderness, path that he had followed wild utterly alone. Not even God could acknowledge him. Hovering many things, many times, between life and death, even vomiting blood, his life has been one of establishing a model of sexual morality. The life of phonics that had to raise again remain rule of his promise to God. Though he was innocent, Reverend Moon 
has had to endure unjust imprisonment six times for working in the underground independence movement when he was studying in Japan in early days, for propagating the will of God. Pyongyang, which was under communist rule immediately after Korea independence, during the Syngman uh, Rhee administration after Korean had been reborn as a free nation. And furthermore, even in the United States, which proudly present itself to the world as a model of democracy. Who on earth can understand the life of Reverend Moon? A life that has been one of perfecting a model of sexual morality. His has been a life missionary. By beating his, his tongue, he has endured for the sake of comforting God and for the salvation of the fallen people of the world who are suffering in the realm of God, so in the realm of death. And even now, if someone were to look into my heart and speak one word of sympathy, I will burst into tears and my tears will f flow like a waterfall. And therefore, so there is only one way to recover the realm of lineage. The right of the elder son and the right of the ownership. This is the path to win the natural subjugation of Satan and to have Satan surrender voluntarily. What is the secret to accomplish this? It can only be accomplished by the power of true love. When we love our enemies more than we love our own children. We are now in page 149, True Love. Then what is true love? Its essence is to give, to live for the sake of others, and for the sake of the whole. True love gives, forgets that it has given, and continues to give without ceasing. True love gives joyfully. We find it in the joyful and loving heart of a mother who cradles her baby in her arms and nurses it at, it at her breast. True love is sacrificial love, as with a devoted son who gains his greatest satisfaction through helping his parents. When we are bound together in true love, we can be, to get, we can be together forever continually rejoicing in each other's company. The attraction of true love brings all things in the universe to our feet. Even God will come to dwell with us. Nothing can compare to the value of true love. It has the power to dissolve the barriers fallen people have created, including national boundaries, and the barriers of race and even religion. The main attributes of God's true love are that it is absolute, unique, unchanging, and eternal. So whoever practices true love will live with God, share his happiness, and enjoy the right to participate as an equal in his work. Therefore, a life lived for the sake of others, a life of true love, is the absolute prerequisite for entering the kingdom of heaven. We are now in page 150. The spirit world really exists. Ladies and gentlemen, each person has a mind and body, and a spirit self that is more elevated than the mind. 
God resides in the world in which we live with our physical bodies and also in the spirit world to which our spirits are destined to pass on. Therefore, only when we have become completely one with God in true love are we complete. Such a perfected person might be a small individual but would represent all of history and all potential future relationships. And so could be said to possess infinite value. Once we are aware of this universal value, we realize that our lives should be led, should be led by and carried out in service to our minds for the sake of perfecting a standard of absolute sexual morality. That is why your conscience knows and perceive not only every action you have performed, but also every thought you have entertained. Your conscience is aware of these things before your teachers, parents, or even God are. Hence, if you were to live in absolute obedience to the commands of your conscience, which is your teacher for eternity, you would be absolutely guaranteed to have eternal life. Such is the way of God's creation. We are now in page 151. When viewing the structure of a human being from a different angle, we can recognize that God created us as beings with dual characteristics. He created our physical bodies as miniatures of the corporeal, tangible world and our spiritual bodies as representatives of and lords of the incorporeal world. Accordingly, his intention was that we would live for 100 years or so in the physical world. And once the physical body ceases to function, pass on naturally and automatically into incorporeal spirit world. In this way, though it cannot per be perceived by the eyes in our physical bodies, the spirit world is the automatic and in inevitable extension of our lives on earth. Humankind's eternal, original homeland created by God. The spirit world does actually exist. It is not a world that has been fantasized or imagined into existence. We do not have the right to choose. It is not a world we cannot go to if we please or refuse to go. So if we would rather not, just as God is eternal and unchanging, the spirit world he created is also eternal and unchanging. Just as we live in the physical world in our physical bodies, and form all sorts of relationships with the existing world. In the spirit world, we are destined to go, to go on, living in our spiritual bodies, forming and maintaining close relationships with all phenomena of the spirit world. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to, uh, of course, our illustrious Dr. Ezra Karimi and uh, our faithful brother uh, Francis and the wonderful young faces uh, are here from the fundraising witnessing leadership team and uh, our dear brother. 
team leader, Mr. Mazo Hiko. Hiko. Mazo Se? Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, our dear faithful sister, Mira. But uh, those who are on the phone line, maybe 10 people, they, you, ha you don't have the pleasure that I do to see the wonderful young faces that are looking at me right now. Amen? Amen. So we're glad to have your young faces and listen to your young reading, young voices uh, speak this morning. Uh, anyone has anything they'd like to share this morning with us? <coughs> Some reflection of the reading this morning? I have one. My one, I have a few, but anyway, one is, uh, I guess since... We just acknowledged our yearly annual um, annual Easter Sunday and Good Friday. Uh, the crucifixion is Good Friday, and uh, Easter is when Jesus resurrected in three days. Uh, but as you know, that Jesus before or during his the process of his crucifixion and the cruelty that he experienced, one of the, he said seven things, seven last words that came out of his mouth. And one of them was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the context of that was when in the, I think the whole process took nine hours, but three hours of that was darkness. <coughs> the whole world went dark for three hours. And that's when Jesus cried out. <coughs> but as we know from our true father, that that was the time when even God had to turn his own face. He didn't want to watch. God was not there. He just had to leave the presence. So of course Jesus didn't feel his presence. But uh, the untold suffering. But then this morning when I read this passage, it reminded me of the same process. And it says here, Father says, it has been a course that took him down thorny paths through the wilderness, paths that, had, that he had to follow while utterly alone. Not even God could acknowledge him, hovering many times between what? Life and death, even vomiting blood. His life has been one of establishing a model of sexual purity, a life of a phoenix that had to rise again to remain true to his promise to God. So again, not even God could acknowledge him. Even during the crucifixion, even God had to turn his face. But that was the price that had to be paid because Jesus came also to establish sexual purity. But he, had, he didn't have time to do that. Amen? But Father did. So Father became the living the living sacrifice, the living crucified Christ. Amen? But the course has never changed. That they had to go into untold suffering. So the Father was beaten to death like Jesus was. The only thing that God preserved his life. Only then, as I said three times, Adam, Jesus, and Father said, on the third attempt, Satan cannot win. It's impossible. That's why Father was able to live through the same almost untold cruelty that Jesus en endured. But Father was the living Christ, so there's a point where even God won't even allow it. Has to turn his face. And like, but God was so proud 
of both Jesus and Father, that through all of that, they became examples of true love to the world. Amen? So that struck me this morning, as many other things do. I'm just read, I really like this book. This is Actually, this is a compilation of Father's speeches before he went, really, his main compilation of speeches that he gave before he left. I know 2008, but still, he, you know, this is a world tour that his mother and he did, and he did do it. That's the piece. Anybody else like to share anything? Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. You want to say something? The little one, the other young one back there, his, his eyes look like he wanted to say something. No? Okay. It's always good to hear. Huh? Come on by. No, come, come. So they can hear, they can't hear you. We as young generation, some members among LPG have never seen true parents in presence. Uh, some of them saw true mother last year, um, Christmas time in Las Vegas, but uh, not everyone has personal experience closely with true parents. And not deeply related to the content itself, but how can we leave the legacy of true parents in our daily life and mission, in our public life, to future generations? It is our uh, responsibility you know, to, if you have uh, children, they will have less and less chance they may not be able to see true parents either but it is our uh, portion responsibility to substantiate true parents foundation and tradition in this way as DC you know church members have been uh, continuing this Hundoke tradition and I really hope that we young you know, brothers and sisters can also inherit the spirit and the heart, you know, sacrifice of elder brothers and sisters and pass it on to next generations in uh, our lifetime. Mm. I just feel so important uh, attending this Hundoke for three days, this uh, workshop time, and I'm grateful for elder brothers and sisters who have been sacrificing 
and uh, making effort you know, in your busy schedule. That I would like to do the same, and I would like to do even better to show the example to my children and young brothers and sisters. And you know, we want to do the same for you know, our future. That's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Let's give them a hand clap. Yeah. Anybody else like to uh, just briefly? I like to. Uh, anyway, I know it's not easy to come, but when I see those who decide to make, it is also a great blessing, and also not only a blessing, but um, uh, as your elder brother, there's a uh, a uh, the, the beginning point of a certain discipline that will raise rise to, you will rise to a different occasion, you know, and victory will come in that way. It's not easy, but, you know, follow it, let it every day, okay? Yeah. So it's always good to see you here. Anybody else? On page uh, 143, uh, in the section subtitled Sexu Absolute Sexual Morality and Conjugal Act, um, there is a sentence that struck my mind uh, very profoundly that says, Thus, human beings must follow the way of absolute standard in keeping with the demand of the heavenly path. Uh, <coughs> then towards the end of that uh, speech, uh, what also strikes me is God as the creator, as he, uh, they, if we follow this path, the end result of that is they would have perfected their character and as co-creator stood with God, the creator, as his equals. I was evaluating this path of uh, absolute sexual molarity. What is the end result? when you follow a certain course. We know in our lifetime we, there are many, many careers. Uh, you go to uh, primary school, then high school, then college, then you go to many different kind of career. Uh, maybe in health, you have to become a nurse. Uh, in, in the health mini uh, you have to become a doctor. In, uh, to become army, you've got to uh, become commander and a general. You've got to go through training. It's a course of training. <coughs> then, when everybody else, you are a general, everybody else salutes you. Because uh, you are the topmost. So, but... Uh, Everybody else uh, in all these other career, there is big hierarchy, and uh, there is now in every country they say uh, commander in chief in the army. This is no more rank, and no one is equal to commander in chief. Everybody obey commander in chief. No one equal. So. But here, God allows us, when we follow the course of absolute mor mm. sexual morality, we become equal with co-creator God. This is a strike, my mind. 
uh, if they had refrained from eating and observed heaven's command, they would have perfected their character. And as co-creators stood with God, the creator, as his equal. So this course and career makes us become equal with God. It is not like other places, uh, other careers and other paths and other course where there is hierarchy and no one can be equal to you. But here God allows us to follow this path and course and become equal to God. So, uh, which career do you want to follow? Where you, uh, you become equal with God and a co-creator with God? Uh, God is the commander-in-chief of whole universe and whole creation and uh, he makes us uh, co-creator and become equal with him. So I was reflecting uh, when I was sitting there and seeing, oh God is so fair and good. He allows and makes possible possibility when we follow this course accurately then we can become like him. So this is really uh, straight my mind this morning. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, anyone else? If not, if not, um, let us rise and uh, have unison prayer.